Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to be in chapters 29 through 31 today, which is basically a monologue section of Job. Let me review quickly the context coming in. Chapter 27 is the final answer of Job to his three friends. And then in chapter 28, Job does a monologue on wisdom. Now, at the closing of 28, 28, 28, is where it speaks of the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and depart from evil is understanding. Now, this depart from evil gives us a, a, a beginning picture of Israelite ethics. Now, we're not sure Job is an Israelite, but it does reflect the the status in that day of what was understood to be the will of God. So an explication of that in chapters 29 through 31 is what we're going to deal with. Now 29 is basically how things were in the past, the days of Job's blessedness by God. Chapter 30 is the present, where wicked men have come to assail him. And what a radical difference between 29 and 30. And then in 31 is an ethical a curse formula where Job denies that he has participated in any kind of evil that his three friends have accused him of. And he uses this curse formula, if I've done this, then let this happen to me. And that's what chapter 31 is all about. So this is a, a literary unit, if you please, 29 through 31. Let's look at 29 then. And Job again took up his discourse and said... Oh, that I were as in months gone by. Now, there is the background. Basically, this is the good old days, okay? Now, if you want to turn over to quickly in chapter 30, look at 30 verse 1. But now. Look at 9. And now. Look at 16. And now. So here we have a contrast between the good old days and the pitiful present, if you please. Okay? Now, as in the days when God watched over me, verse 2b through five is God's care, protection, and blessing of Job. So it's kind of a rendition of the blessings that God gave him when his lamp shone over my head. Notice the emphasis this on lamp and light, okay? Uh, it reminds me of Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's presence gave truth and light on how to live and what was appropriate. Notice where it says here, um, verse four. As I was in the prime of my day, pardon me, this word prime is basically the word autumn. Now, it doesn't mean autumn as far as his life is almost over. It means autumn in the sense of maturity, time of harvest, a good time, full time. That's the idea. When the friendship of God was over my tent. Now, of course, Job lived in a house. His children did. The house fell on That's what killed him. Job is in a patriarchal setting where he still acts as priest. So we're in a patriarchal uh, Abraham kind of setting. And Abraham lived in tents, but there were regular villages. And apparently Job was a resident uh, elder. Some think he was a king of a small area. But apparently he lived in a house. This is a, what is, a, is known as dealing with things that are idealized in the past. Okay. Now, it says the Almighty was yet with me. Now, the Almighty, El the general name for God, Shaddai, God Almighty, is the patriarchal name for God. Yahweh was not revealed until Moses at the burning bush. Was yet with me. Now notice the emphasis on God being with Job in his home. Job is strangely silent on any of the cultists. And by that I mean the priest, the law, the sacrificial system. It's just not anywhere in Job. That has caused many to believe, since there's no tribe given, that Job is not an Israelite, or that he was. it was written and he lived before the days when the developed Mosaic legislation was put in practice in the nation of Israel. Notice where it says in verse 6, these two metaphors for prosperity. When my steps were bathed in butter, <laughs> sounds funny, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil, now, these are metaphors of prosperity and blessing, okay? When I went out to the gate of the city and I took my seat in the square. Now, the gate of the city would be much, I don't know if you've 
grow up in a small town, but in county seat towns, there's a little square, and the courthouse is on the square. And that's kind of the center of the social life, the judicial life of the city. Well, that's what Job is talking about, that the square of the marketplace, the gate of the walls, was where the elders came to talk about problems, to set, settle disputes, to uh, have their parties, to have their weddings, to have their social gatherings. So apparently Job is an elder, and this would be the place of justice or social life. Verse 8. The young men saw me and hid themselves, and the old men rose and stood. Well, this is the idea of showing respect. It's not the, run, the young men hid, and they moved out of the way when Job came. And even the older men stood. This is another example of those who think he was a king, or at least the chief judge or officer or elder in that town. It, uh, places like this make them think that. Let me skip down to verse 12 if I could. For in verse 12 begins a series of very concrete righteous acts. Now since Job is not familiar with the cultists, he is right with God by his personal relationship, we call the vertical relationship, and also how he treats other people in society, the horizontal relationship. And there are eight of these. Number one is in verse 12. I deliver the poor. So he was basically... Helpful to the needy. Look at number two. The orphan who had no helper. He helped those who had were ostracized in the community. Look at number three, verse 13. Uh, Bless the one ready to perish. Now, this seems maybe the sick people, okay? Uh, he helped them. Look at the latter part of verse 13. The widow's heart sing for joy. He helped the widow. And now, verse 14 is a description. And I'm going to come back to that. At verse 15, number five. He helped the blind. Verse 15. He helped the crippled. Verse 16, he helped the needy or the poverty struck. Uh, number 17, he helped the stranger. Uh, he brought their case to court when really they had no one to talk for them. And so there's the eight different social groups that he helped and worked with and uh, tried to make life good for them. Okay? Now back to verse 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. Here is an example of clothing used as a metaphor for good deeds or spiritual characteristics. You might want to see Job 19.9, Psalms 32, verses 9, 16, and 18, and then Isaiah 59.17. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 speaks of judicial action on behalf of the person mentioned in verse 16b the stranger, the alien, okay? Now, verse 18 calls some problems in interpretation where it says, Then I thought I shall die in my nest. Well, what does my nest mean? Well, some have said it means Job's home. Some have said it means with his children. But if you look at the, the parallel in 18b, it seems to follow the Septuagint's translation of old age. Now, 18b backs that up. So here we have in verse 18 uh, an idea that I think, because of context, because of a parallel translation, old age is better than nest. Look at verse 19. My roots is spread out to the waters, and dew lies all night on my branch. Now, in Palestine, the rains did not come, but very early, the early and the latter rains. Uh, the primary moisture came from dew. And here, both subterranean water and dew, uh, in the sense of prosperity and growth and lushness and... Uh, um, for, you know, for, uh, for those kind of things. Now, in verse 20, the word bow is used. Bow, in the Bible, and to be a bow and arrow, I think, is a metaphor for strength, health, vitality, vigor, and that's where it is here. Um, in verse 21, down through 25, again speaks of Job as a chief counselor. Now, many think he was a king. In verse 25, my New American trans, uh, Standard Translation says, I choose a way for them. But there's another possible translation that's mentioned in that commentary uh, put out by InterVarsity Press, the Tyndale Old Testament one, that say, on page 234 that says, this is a good possible Hebrew translation. Quote, I was chosen as their governor. I think that fits uh, the earlier part about every, the old men stood up, the young men moved out of the way. That seems to fit. And so I think Job was a very uh, high government official. What he was exactly, I'm not sure. Now chapter 30. But now, what a great contrast. This, chapter 30 is kind of the old proverb, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. 
or the taller they are, the farther they fall. Um, that's the idea here. Job had such a blessed life, such a neat relationship with God and men, that when it crashed, not only did his relationship with God seem to be silent, but, the, but men that he had helped rejected him. Matter of fact, the first few verses of this, 1 through 8, really probably 1 through 15, describe the wicked men that were, that were just the dredges of society. And now he was their uh, proverbial song. Uh, he had become the laughing stock of everyone uh, that uh, before uh, was just the outcast of society. The lowest possible social echelon were now making fun of him. That's how far he came. From the very top to the lowest of the low. Now, this chapter, though, is very easy to read and very self-explanatory. I want to pick up a couple of things that I think are interesting. In verse 23, notice the parallel between death and the house of the meeting of all the living. Well, let me go back to verse 22. I missed that one. When it says, Thou dost cause me to lift up and ride on the wind, only God rides on the wind. Psalms 18.10 for, for frail human mankind to ride on the wind was not a great experience, but tragedy, disaster. Uh, their bodies couldn't stand it. And that's the ideal here. Now, 23 speaks of the, the house of the meeting of all the dead. It's, it talks about Sheol, the place where the dead go. All the dead, the righteous dead, the unrighteous dead. Everybody goes to Sheol. Now, in verse 24 and following, it's kind of a summary of the unfairness of Job's situation. Verses 24 through 31. Uh, verse 26, the real paradox. This is the same nagging problem of, why do the righteous suffer? Listen to verse 26. When I expected good, then evil came. When I waited for light, then darkness came. Boy, Job says it's just not fair. Ladies and gentlemen, I assert to you, until you are able to struggle theologically with the unfairness of a fallen world, you're always going to be in jeopardy. Um, I'm reminded of 1 Peter 4, 12 and following, where it says, why does it surprise you when these fiery ordeals come? As though some strange thing were happening to you. In the book of Hebrews it says that Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered. Suffering, I've done a tape on that. Suffer, why me? Uh, I hope you'll send for our catalog of over 2,500 teaching tapes and that tape is listed. We all start with, well, I've been good this week. I've witnessed, I've tithed, I've done whatever you think is good. And then we think nothing should happen to us. We really, if we're not careful, get on a works righteousness, not only that our works make us acceptable to God, but that our works uh, continue to make us able to receive God's blessing. Galatians chapter 3 is such a paradox of that. Paul says, were you saved by the Spirit to be perfected in the flesh? You foolish Galatians. And yet in the back of all of our minds, we're thinking, if I'm not good, God won't love me. But if I'm good, God will bless me and give me more. That was traditional Old Testament theology. Job reacts against that. Psalm 73 reacts against that because it's not true to life. Sometimes God's very best do suffer. That's the book of Job. And Job doesn't even know why. And he thinks God is being unfair. And that's the ideal here. Now in verse 28 and 30 is an interesting uh, play on words. The word in 28 is the word blackened. Now, my New American Standard calls it mourning. Uh, now, you might want to see Psalms 38, 6, where the same word is used. The second little Hebrew phrase, blackened, but not by the heat of the sun. So it's not a burntness. But then in verse 30, there is a burntness. Now, maybe it refers to his physical disease. Maybe it refers to the absence of light. Maybe it refers to the fact that, that when you're burnt, you, you're unresponsive. I don't know what it's exactly referring to, but it's obvious here. It's a metaphor for Job's condition. Now, beginning in chapter 31. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Now, the word, the literal Hebrew here, I have cut a covenant. As you remember back in Samuel and Kings, and the way to make a covenant was to have a dinner with someone. And then even to precede that, an animal died. Something died. The, the blood of the covenant uh, and they would sometimes cut an animal in half and put the animal on both sides. And the people who made the covenant would walk between that animal. It, it seems to be that the, the ancient meaning was if one of the parties break the covenant, 
let it happen to them as happened to this animal. Something like that, a curse formula maybe. Because chapter 31 is really a, a series of curse formulas. It's kind of like a cross my heart and hope to die in our culture. What Job is saying is, if I've done this, let this happen to me. If I've committed this sin, which I have not, let this happen. And all the way through here, look at verse 5. Uh, if I have. Look at verse 6. Let him. Look at verse 7. If my steps. Look at verse 8. Let me. Look at verse 9. If my heart. Look at verse 10. May my wife. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying a curse on me if I've done these things. Now, a lot of that he was accused of by the different three friends he's going to react against now. Okay? I made a covenant with my eyes. How then should I gaze at a virgin? Now, this seems to be an uh, allusion to sexual sin. And, and it, it picks up again down in verse 9. And some have said, well, verse, this verse 1's out of place and should be moved to verse 9. Really, the uh, Oriental mind does not function as the Western mind. One reason we don't understand the Russians is because they're basically Eastern and we're basically Greek. <clears throat> what he's saying is here, I have not lusted after women. I have not let my eyes uh, 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 roamed. That's what he's saying to us. Look what, look what he says, the second thing. Oh, that what is the portion of God from above, or the heritage of the Almighty from on high? This ideal of heritage is really caught up with sexual sins, as we'll see down in verse 9, alluring at the neighbor's doorway. Adultery was so serious for two reasons. Number one, it really fouled up the inheritance pattern by tribes. And the land was so important as a promise from God. But secondly, in the older parts of the Old Testament, a man lived on in his children. So you can imagine what a problem would be if what he thought was his children were really not his children. He'd be hoping in an afterlife somehow caught up with their lives. And yet if they were someone else's, his hope would be gone. So for inheritance purposes... And their, their views of the afterlife, adultery was a very, very serious sin. Uh, fornication was not as serious because it didn't involve inheritance. and didn't involve uh, uh, afterlife in the sense of you weren't counting on those being your kids. And I think that we need to see that in our day. You might want to see Ecclesiasticus chapter 9 verse 5 where Ben Sirah talks about the problem of dealing with virgins. Now, uh, is not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work iniquity? Does not he see my ways and number all my steps? Job is saying, Psalm 139, God knows me. God knows my heart. I haven't done this thing. Uh, this is unfair. I, I have not done this. If someone did this, they should be punished. But I haven't done this. That's what he's going to say throughout the chapter. If I have walked with falsehood, my foot has hastened after deceit, let him weigh me in the accurate scales. Now, I think you've seen probably the, the cultural image of a justice where she is a lady dressed in a long robe with a blindfold and she's holding the scales in her hands. Well, blind justice. The word for weight, weighing is, the, is often used as a metaphor for judgment in the New Testament. Now, uh, if my step has turned away from the weight. Now, the way, remember that biblical faith is primarily initial response followed by lifestyle response. The earliest title for the church was The Way, all the way through Acts, many times, before they are called Christians at Antioch of Syria. Uh, basically, this speaks about we know God's way because we've been given some guidelines, we've been given some rules. And these rules we have understood. And the, and the basic term here is well-worn wagon tracks. And that's what we have here. Now, notice if you would where it mentions, uh, let me sow and another eat and let my, carps be up, my crops be uprooted. The idea, if I've done that, that my crops fail. Now, in verse 9 through 12 is an allusion to sexual sins. And I want you, I want you to see what, what it's talking about here when it says, If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another and let others kneel down over her. Now, it's obvious to me that the kneel down over her is a way of referring, it's a euphemism for sexual intercourse. Now, many have thought that the word grind relates to that. Well, t rabbinical tradition says in a little book called The Testament of Job, his wife, and it's called S-I-T-I-S, Sittis, had to carry water and hire herself out as a slave to buy enough bread for her and Job. Now, that is basically rabbinical tradition. Because of the parallel in 9 through 12, I'm not sure if it means servitude or sexual servitude, but it's, it is one of those. Now, notice where it says, verse 11, it, it is a lustful crime. 
Now this refers to adultery, and notice it says it's punishable by, by the judges. This was a capital offense. Adultery was a capital offense. Now think how serious it was to them. Leviticus 20, verse 10, Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. And verse 12, we have the idea about a fire that consumes to Abaddon. Now, Abaddon is a name for Satan, and later on in Pilgrim's Progress, but it means destruction in Hebrew. Um, fire connected with Sheol is an unusual kind of thing. Now, fire connected with judgment is a very common thing. God is a symbol is symbolized in fire. It doesn't come from Zoroaster. It comes from the Old Testament, where God appears on the altar, the, the shining cloud of glory, the Shekinah glory. But it, the logical sequence was, if a man is guilty here and God judges him in fire, that there may be fire in the afterlife. And that's where this seemed to develop. Let me give you a few references. Job 15, 30 and 34. Job 20, verse 6. Job 22, verse 20, and Deuteronomy 32, 22. You might want to see those. Verse 13 is a very interesting verse because it's such a, a modern understanding in a sense. If I have despised the claim of my male and female slaves when they have filed a complaint against me, what then could I do when God arises? Now the unusual thing is that Job allowed not only his male servants to uh, accuse him of unfairness, but he allowed his female servants to accuse him of unfairness, which was totally unheard of in his day. And yet here, uh, there's a real equality among male and female servants. And in verse 15 has been one of the strongest comments on Job's understanding of the dignity of all men. Did not he who made me in the womb make him and the same one fashion us in the womb? Here's the idea of the creatorship of God of all men and the worth and dignity of all men. We see some of that in Malachi chapter 2. But here, even stronger than anywhere else, Job's understanding of the worth and dignity of men and women of all ages, all social castes, and on and on. Now in verse 16 it talks about, he, Did not he who made me from the womb make him? Verse 16, excuse me. If I have kept the door from their desire, or if I have caused the eye of the widow to fail. Now the widow is a very important thing in the book of Deuteronomy, that those who are ostracized by society be included by those of faith. Listen to this. Write these down. Deuteronomy 10, 18, 24, 17 through 26, 26, 12 and 13, and 27, 19, and James 1, 27. It's a characteristic of a godly man to help the widow, the orphan, the alien. Okay. Now down in verse 24 through 28, we have Job reacting to Eliphaz's speech in chapter 22, 24 and following. Some say that verses 16 through, 20 feet, through 23 are, is Job reacting to Eliphaz's charges in chapter 22, 7 through 9, and that may be true. Now, in verses, uh, let's see, 26 and 27, Job is saying, I've never worshipped the astral deities, which would be the stars, the sun, the moon, uh, the heavenly body. He's saying, I've never worshipped them, and I never blew them a kiss or kissed them. It's, it, this kissing of bring the hand close to the mouth with a kiss is something that was done in the pagan uh, Canaanite uh, worship. Verse 28, you ought to see Deuteronomy 17, 2 and following for that. Now, in verses 31, 32, and 34, I'm not sure about 33, but 31, 32, and 34 seem to be an allusion to homosexuality or sodomy. It seems to be related. The word satisfied means satiated or satisfied with flesh. It doesn't seem to be referring to food, but to the idea of sex. It seems to be related to Genesis 19.2 and Judges 19.20. Okay? And you can see that in verse uh, 34 about afraid to go out outdoors because of the great multitude, which seems to relate to the, the angels wanting to be sodomized by the people of Sodom and the, the, the uh, wicked men in Judges 19 who killed the man's concubine. They wanted him, and he gave her his concubine. So it's a, a horrible thing. Now in verse 35, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Job really wants God to meet with him. That's been his plea throughout this. Thir chapter 13, 22 and 23. Chapter 19, 23 and 24. Chapter 23, 4. God, come talk to me. And really, verses 35 through 37 set the stage for God's response to Job found in chapter 38, 1 through 41, 34. Okay? Now, it says, my signature. God still, he still wants his legal indictment or, or a, a legal acquittal. The Hebrew word is the last letter of their alphabet, the ta, T-A-W is how we spell it. Uh, and it was, it's kind of used like we use, put your X here, 
Well, this meant a signature, and that's what, what's used. And then verse 38 says, The lamb cries out against me. Remember how Abel's blood cried up to God because of Cain's murder of him in Genesis 3.10? That's the idea. If you want to see a, a, di a little different idea, you might want to see Job chapter 24, verse 2, where the same idea is used. Well, here we have Job's final appeal of his innocence. Uh, he has said the good old days and the, the terrible present, and now he says in God, it's almost like a legal thing. He's presenting a case. This is the way it was. This is the way it is. This is my, my claim of innocence. And so now in the following chapters, Elihu is going to speak, and God's very pleased with what Elihu speaks, and then God's going to speak. God never tells Job why. God never answered Job's question, but Job is humbled, and Job is brought into a deeper relationship, and that's the whole purpose, really. The, the question of the, why do the righteous suffer is never really answered in Job. But boy, the steadfast relationship of a faithful God is certainly found there. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again same time.